What's up, guys? My name is Tony, a.k.a. Son of the Bat, from the Super Friends Podcast, and you are watching the Hall of Justice. It's that could blow up the What's up, everybody? Welcome back to the Hall of Justice. Now, I know I've been gone for a while. A lot of it has to do with vacation. A lot more of it has to do with technical difficulties, both on my part and on my part. So sorry about that. I do apologize, but again, we are back. And like I always like to tell you, we are recording from San Diego Comics, one of the oldest comic shops in San Diego. They have one of the largest variety of back issues, which you'll find for 25% off if they're $10 or under. And of course, anything that comes out that's brand new, as well as trade paperbacks, are all 15% off. I'd also like to let you guys know that we're still working with Greg Horn, so if you head over to greghornart.com, you can get 10% off your entire purchase by entering promo code TSFPOD at checkout. So do yourselves a favor, stop by greghornart.com and pick up some amazing books. So to start off with you guys, I want to go ahead and share something by Brian Michael Bendis, who, as a lot of us know, moved from Marvel over to DC. Now, one of the first books that he's worked on, of course, is Man of Steel and Superman. But his first creator-owned project that he's doing with DC, through his studio Jinx War, is titled Pearl. And we're on issue number one right now. So Pearl follows the story of a young girl by the same name as the title, who happens to be an exceptional tattoo artist as well as an assassin for the Yakuza in San Francisco. Now, the first story really gets into her trying to figure out how she can live more of a quote-unquote normal life. And for those of you who have read past works such as Jessica Jones by Brian Michael Bendis, this definitely has that same feel. You do get small touches in regards to backstory for Pearl in regards to how she started learning how to use a gun, both as a tool for art as well as the weapon. But to be completely honest with you guys, one of my favorite things about this book is the fact that they do have a reprint of an older story, an actual Elseworlds that Brian Brian Michael Bendis did prior to doing his long contract with Marvel. It's all the way in the back and it was called Citizen Wayne. Now of course that's based off the movie Citizen Kane and the story runs basically the same way the movie does. So again with this being Brian Michael Bendis' first creator owned project it was pretty fitting to have his first project with DC as a reprint in the back of the book. And again that is Pearl issue number one by DC Comics. So next up for DC I wanted to go ahead and share Batman issue 53 by DC Comics. Now this actually completes a storyline called Cold Days, of course by Tom King who's been on Batman for a while. From the beginning of this story, which was about two issues ago, it's had a real feel of 12 Angry Men, mainly due to the fact that you have Bruce Wayne as a juror for a trial against Mr. Freeze. The ending to this seemed pretty fitting and got to the point fairly quickly. But one of the best things that I loved about the end is the fact that through all the pain that Batman has suffered in regards to not actually following through with the wedding because of Catwoman's absence, Batman does decide to shed the costume he's been using for the last year or so, allowing him to return to a more classic look, which I really, really like. So guys, I highly recommend this book, especially since it does finish off a three-issue story arc. Again, that's Batman number 53, written by Tom King. Now, moving on to Marvel, which actually had a lot of number ones come out this week, I wanted to go ahead and share with you guys Astonishing X-Men Annual Number One. Now, as you can see by the cover art, it brings together all of the original X-Men that, of course, are still alive. So this excludes Scott Summers, aka Cyclops. The way it begins is by having all of them return to a restaurant which they originally used to dine at, which was one of Professor Xavier's favorite places to eat. Unfortunately, it wasn't so much so for the team itself. While reminiscing about the really bad couple of years that they've had recently, the X-Men are interrupted by what seems to be Professor Xavier. Professor X lets them know about a nearby town which has been plagued by Lucifer, an old adversary of his. We really don't get an explanation as to how Professor X is alive, and in this situation, having control of a completely different body. But towards the end of the book, we have Professor X explaining to the team that the reason he had them come together, at this point in time, was to make them realize that what they've been doing has been good and should bring happiness to their lives. And after what I would call a mind wipe, which is what it pretty much looks like, the team ends up having dinner again the next week, acting as if everything was fine and dandy. It's a good read, and it's really nice to see all of the characters, except for one, back together again. So again, I do recommend it. It is Astonishing X-Men Annual Number 1. Now, continuing on with the X-Men, we have the title, Extermination, issue number one coming out this week. Now, as the title may hint, some people do die, and it happens right here in the first issue. We're first introduced to Scott Summers, the younger Scott Summers, going on a date with Bloodstorm. Unfortunately, that date does get interrupted by Ahab, the person responsible for giving Rachel Summers her tattoos in the future. 
Like I said, there's a few characters that get killed off immediately in this book, and I don't want to get into it because I do want you to read it. But with death also comes new life in a sense, with a character being introduced at the end of the book. I wouldn't so much say an introduction as much as a reimagining or possibly a different version of a character a lot of us know and love. So for this being a mini-series and setting us up to basically put the original X-Men back in their timeline, which is what we've been told might happen, I really do suggest reading this book. Again, that's Extermination number one. Next up, we have another annual with Cable and Deadpool annual number one. Now, like most Deadpool stories, if not all Deadpool stories, things do get kooky right off the bat. We come across Deadpool being told by someone who comes from the future that he needs to save his mother before he ends up not being born. Which again, like I said, it already starts off pretty kooky. Now, of course, with anything regarding time travel, we do have Cable in the mix. And what we come to find out is that the person that he's hunting down to save his mother isn't actually his mom. And that the person that sent him to save his mother has an unhealthy fascination with her. Now, of course, fortunately, through it all, Deadpool and Cable do save the day. And like most Deadpool books, one of the... F and like most Deadpool books, one of the most fun things about it is the fact that he breaks the fourth wall multiple times throughout it. Make sure you pick up Cable and Deadpool, annual issue number one. Again, this week we are hit by another issue number one with the first issue of Edge of Spider-Geddon. So just to tell you guys right off the bat, I'm not very well versed in the whole Spider-Verse itself. I know about the different Spider-Women, including Spider-Gwen, as well as Spider-Man Noir and a couple of others. However, I'm not too sure if this is a brand new character, but he goes by Spider-Punk. And his world is one run by, of course, Anarchy. Now, one of the cool things that I really liked about this book is the fact that we run into a different version of Kang the Conqueror. This one from this reality's future coming into the past and trying to capitalize on Spider-Punk's legacy. One of my absolutely favorite parts about this book is we do see a punk version of the Incredible Hulk. And towards the end we do see an alternate reality Spider-Woman show up and let Spider-Punk know that she needs his assistance in saving the entire Spider-Verse. If you've been enjoying any of the Spider-Verse connected books, you'll definitely enjoy this. And just a heads up, all of the issues for Spider-Geddon connect to the Superior Octopus. So again, that's Edge of Spider-Geddon, issue number one. Next up from Marvel, and in the Star Wars universe, we have Star Wars Beckett, issue number one. So for those of you who watched and enjoyed the Han Solo solo film, you're definitely going to love this. And you'll remember that Woody Harrelson was the one who played the character Beckett. The interesting thing about this book is that it starts off with three chapters in one book. And they all blend very well in regards to showing Beckett's escapades as a bandit. Now, I'm not very well versed in the Han Solo film. However, I do realize that there are some characters in this book that also showed up in the film. You basically get a feel of what Beckett does with his crew. And when you're reading it with Woody Harrelson's voice in mind, it's actually a pretty good read. So again, guys, that's Beckett number one by Marvel. The next book I want to go ahead and share with you guys is one that a lot of people have been excited about, and it's on issue two. And of course, I'm talking about Infinity Wars number two. So before I get started with what's in this book, I want to also let you guys know that each shop got about one in seven, I wouldn't call it variants, but completely different covers for issue number two. This one, of course, shows us Requiem with her mask. And as you can see from the picture that I just posted here, we also have a version with the mask off. It's unsolicited as a variant and in general unsolicited altogether. So if you go to your local comic shop and you do find that version, definitely pick it up. Now, for those of you who read issue one and for those who haven't, this might be a spoiler. We do get a look at what seemed to be Gamora killing Star-Lord. However, with Doctor Strange having the Time Stone, we realize that completely changes immediately. However, as much as it looks like this new Infinity Watch that Doctor Strange has put together is actually doing their job, Gamora, while using the Reality Stone, changes the actual outcome in the end. And it gets really brutal. I'm not going to share anything inside the pages. It's a really, really good read. This is probably like the most brutal issue thus far. Of course, we only have two, plus Prime if you include that one. One of the crazy things about this as well is that Gamora does finally come in contact with her old self, which was stuck in the Soul Gem. But what we also notice is the fact that she might be going crazy because she sees Thanos wherever she goes. So already in issue two, it seems like she has all the stones with her. And with the armor that she had created for her, we know that she's going to have an infinity armor instead of a gauntlet. So again, guys, this is a really good read. I highly suggest it. It's Infinity Wars number two. And to round things off, I wanted to go ahead and finish with Thor issue number four. 
Of course, we still have Jason Aaron on the book, which he's been doing amazing for a while now with Thor. Now, in regards to chronology with all of Marvel books, this actually takes place prior to Infinity Wars, and possibly right after the end of this most recent Thanos series, which was last written by Donny Cates. Now, in the last issue, we did have Thanos show up and interrupt the wedding between Hela and Balder. In this issue, we have him talking to Hela and letting her know that their original agreement will now not be completed. When Hela asks Thanos why, he basically says that his plans have changed. And again, as we know in Infinity Wars, he does face death literally at Requiem's sword. And of course, as we know, this story has been leading up to the War of Realms, which is being created by the dark elf Meliketh. So of course, including all of the realms, we have Cinder, the daughter of Surtur, also fighting right now to stop this wedding. And one of the coolest things that I think happens in the battle is Thor actually wearing Hela's crown, becoming king for a slight moment of the dead. Now, as good as Thor has been recently, I'm actually getting really excited for issue number five, which brings back Christian Ward as the artist. Again, that's issue four of Thor. I highly recommend it by Marvel Comics. So guys, before we end the video, I also want to give you a little bit of a treat. Today, we are joined by the chairman of San Diego Comic Fest, Matt Dunford. Now, San Diego Comic Fest will be coming back into town March 7th through the 10th next year. And so Matt's here to go ahead and let you guys know what the lineup is looking like for programming and for exhibitors. And so guys, without further ado, we have Matt Dunford. Matt Dunford, what? how you doing? Oh, Matt Dunford? That guy owes me money. What? Does he? Oh man, I'd get a hold of him as soon as I could because I hear he... He dips everybody. <laughs> yeah, yeah he's, he's completely unreliable. Don't trust him. He is not a, guy, a kind of guy you want to deal with if you're doing any comic books or cartoons or any of that nerdy stuff like this. So don't <laughs> let him around a store like this. However, you are the chairman of San Diego Comic Fest. Uh, yes, I am the chairman of San Diego Comic Fest, going into my third year as chairman and approaching the seventh year of the convention. And right. I'm really looking forward to things. So we're going to be back again Yes. on March 7th through the 10th. We're going back to four-day show this time. Awesome. And we got some really, really big things planned for it this time. So what do we have looking forward to? Because I know this is something that you're working on throughout the whole year up until the day of the show. So what do we have looking forward to? Who are some names that you can kind of drop right now? And what should people really, really expect to see when they get there. Okay, so last year we got labeled America's Best Small Convention, which I was not prepared for, but this year I'm going to try to do us one better because I kind of took offense to that. <laughs> I'm going to try to turn us into America's Best Convention. All right. So this year, there was only one guy I had in mind for Guest of Honor because I've been trying to get this guy since I first started, and he has heard so many good things about how the show has gone. The man was a legend when he was, you know, getting his toes wet in the comic book industry. Our guest of honor is going to be Sergio Aragones, awesome. who is going to be celebrating 60 years of Mad Magazine with us. Well, his Mad Magazine. He no, is. Mad's been around he for is. 67 years by my time <laughs> by then. But he will be celebrating 60 years of Mad Magazine with us next year. And we are completely honored that we get to have his presence. And as our main theme, we're going to be celebrating 50 years of the moon landing. Awesome. And oddly enough, Sergio's first comic, when he was at Mad Magazine back in 1959, was a parody of a moon landing, <laughs> 10 years before it would happen. So, oh my goodness. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Sergio was, uh, Sergio was so far ahead of the game by then. Yeah, obviously. That's, that's amazing. So what, what's the date for next year? I know we got a little while till it's out, but let everyone know when they should be in San Diego. Be in San Diego from the 7th through the 10th. On the 7th, it's not a full day. It's an afternoon party that goes from 4 p.m. till 9 p.m. So if you buy the full day badge, you get to come and hang out with us at our preview night party, right. which is cool. So you get to mingle with all the guests and uh, guests of honors and enjoy things, whether you're a fan of comics, animation, science fiction, and uh, you know, we're going to have a little gaming presence too, one of which I can't really speak of just yet till we make the formal announcements. But we do have a lot of other uh, great themes going up, so... I try not to throw much of my own fanboyism in, but this year I couldn't help myself. <laughs> I try to suit what's best for the convention, but right. this year it's one that's near and dear to me. We are celebrating 25 years of Spider-Man the Animated Series, ever since it debuted on November 19th, 1994. And anyone who knows me knows that it is my all-time favorite cartoon. So series editor, show producer, and main writer John Semper will be joining us nice. for this uh, festivities. And he will be bringing some friends along for the celebration. I can't say who just yet, but we'll just say he'll be bringing some friends along because we're going to have a 
great talk about the Spider-Man 25th and just about anything could happen on that. Another guest that we are cel- we are so happy to have on board is, is acclaimed writer James Robinson, who will be okay. celebrating 25 years of Starman, which for me, I consider Starman to be the best comic of the 90s, and I know someone's going to fight me over that. <laughs> Someone's going to say, what about Hellboy? We'll find out in the comments. Yeah, we'll find out in the comments here. <laughs> so again, guys, that is going to be next year, March, again, what date? 7th through the 10th. 7th through the 10th. So if you're planning on coming to San Diego, please go to San Diego Comic Fest.com, correct? SDComicFest.org. SDComicFest.org. We're not commercial. We're a 501c3 nonprofit. There we go. We're not in this for the money. <laughs> not at all. It's all for the fans. It's all for the people who love comic books and the culture itself. So go check them out. If you guys are looking to be here for all four days, definitely get your passes. You guys are still looking for exhibitors? We are still looking for exhibitors, still looking for Artist Alley. We've expanded our presence for that. And uh, come on in. I believe Artist Alley tables are only $25 if you're a budding young artist or a budding old artist, budding middle-aged artist, whatever. As long as you're budding, you're happy to happy to have you on board. And an artist. And an artist. <laughs> so, guys, again, you heard it here. Go check them out. San Diego Comic Fest is going to be taking place, again, here in San Diego. Probably one of the best cities to have a convention at, of course. March 7th through the 10th. It's clobbering time! That could blow up the...